Let me just have a look. Get started. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, to, today's uh, talk about uh, DevOps and uh, continuous integration and continuous uh, delivery. With it. For uh, so, uh, yeah, who, who am I? Um, I'm Andy. Um, I'm a web developer. I live in uh, Aberdeen in the UK. I've been using Juma for about you know, 10 years, I guess, and, and I've been a developer for about 20 years. <coughs> I mainly, uh, the last couple of years, I've been mainly writing APIs and doing quite a lot of DevOps for uh, working for uh, a company that does. Uh, uh, apps for schools. So we use Juma as a, as a mobile phone application backend through a RESTful API and uh, there's hundreds of apps and some of them are really busy so it's, it's kind of scale out and scale up sort of thing. Uh, yeah, this is where Aberdeen is. It's quite a long way from everywhere. Uh, this is where I live um, and work instantly. Uh, but it looks like this. Uh, inside, <laughs> and, uh, there's some sharks along here in the pool, and some piranhas at the other. Actually, it looks like this. So, um, and you know, I'm not really like a talking, standing up and talking person, so uh, apologies if I'm uh, uh, yeah, nervous, uh, incoherent, or whatever. I'm mainly sitting in the room writing code. Uh, it's good to get out of your comfort zone, apparently. I'm not sure. So, um, so yeah, DevOps and continuous integration, continuous deployment is like a huge topic in itself. So, I thought um, what we're trying to do is, uh, you know, just give a an overview of all the different elements of it, I guess, um, and uh, you know, dive into some uh, some things that are like gym, like uh, sort of practical Joomla centric details. Um, yeah. So, uh, <coughs> uh, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. So we'll cover DevOps, uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment. There's quite a lot of overlap between these three areas, really. Uh, um, so, yeah. So typically, I think this is from Seuss's uh, website. Um, yeah, this pretty standard uh, DevOps flow, where um, <coughs> you know, so you know, in the development side of things, you end up building, writing code, building, testing code, or planning, and then, and then it sort of moves into the operation side of things, and you're releasing, deploying, operating, testing, uh, monitoring, and uh, so that being a picture of DevOps, um, where continuous integration and continuous deployment come in, uh, or continuous. Uh, it's really about doing this cycle as quick as, you know, not as quick as possible, but as, uh, as often as possible, I suppose, you know, um, and to do that, you've really, you've got to automate as, as much as you can, yeah, you automate everything, maybe, so, uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, background, so, um, everything is kind of generically based all the code and examples and stuff that's kind of on a oops, easy enough with the normal sort of Linux uh, uh, sort of platform setup. Um, other platforms are available. Um, yeah, so um, all the examples are in GitHub. I put a repository up yesterday and ask, jump in and ask anything anytime. Uh, and oh, yeah, there's lots of things that aren't included in the talk, but just because they're not in there doesn't mean, doesn't mean they're not important or don't exist. Or, Anyway, so yeah, getting started. So, um, yeah, so automations. Of, yeah, I don't know. You know, it, it's easily getting started with automations. You can automate the thing that takes you longest first. I guess it's very easy, and sort of straightforward. Um, but obviously, um, you're going to start end up uh, writing scripts. So, I don't know. Uh, what does everyone who uses? Uh, I'm just kind of curious of what everyone uses. Who uses Bash for their scripting? You can stick your hands up. Who uses PHP for their scripting? Oh, okay, okay, cool. And who uses JavaScript? No, no. Okay, some like more PHP. Yeah, less. Less good. I like that. It's kind of 
I think I you kind of tend to use all three, but that's probably just from being disorganized more than anything. Uh, and that bit, you know, you think, oh yeah, I write some, I write some node in it because that's fashionable, and then you're like, Shit, this is horrible. Fuck this! It's like JavaScript. It's like, oh. <laughs> so you go back to writing bachelor PhD. But um, yeah, so, so I don't know. Some things are like kind of just generally handy things, like uh, you know, bits of uh, bits of scripting, you know, that you just kind of end up using all the time. It's more, it's more like kind of DevOps, I guess. But, but um, you know, whether it's like you know. Finding a spelling mistake in uh, 300 uh, language files, or you know, this sort of thing. or you know, um, finding large uh, large files and printing a list of them. Um, you know, find out why you used up all your disk space and your server space. So, uh, but that's you know, scratching the scratching the surface really. But um, so yeah, it's. A, so historically, you know, we've all just written scripts and just run them, you know, as cron jobs or, uh, you know, via SSH or locally, you know, just on the, on the command line shell. Uh, but yeah, more, more, there's other options too, for example, moving to sort of a task runner type system, it's, uh, you know, more popular now with like uh, using Gulp or, or Grunt, you know, to, uh, uh, Run, you know, even if it's just little things like compiling your CSS, or cool, less. Uh, but yeah, as, um, a lot of this automation can be done, you know, with if you're sort of a larger projects with uh, continuous integration and continuous distribution systems as well. And um, and Headless Browser is kind of nice for automation to a lot of things. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'll start talking about up updates as a so something will be. So what? Yeah, the handy one. Uh, oh, thanks, Robert. <laughs> yeah, the Gmail command line interface. Uh, uh, it's quite new. It's really nice. Uh, if you want to script things, I uh, just started using it. To be honest, uh, in terms of for updates, you used to always just do everything with head headless browser uh, updates. But yeah, so you can update extensions in uh, GitHub, um, and you just call it like any other command line. Uh, Terminal script. Yeah, so some of these things like installing extensions and running updates. Uh, you know, especially if you're managing like hundreds of sites, it's, uh, yeah, it works really well. And um, yeah, so this is you know for updating if you've got your your own extensions and the Joomla cores. So. I think I need to yeah I think there's maybe some more pictures. Um, but another option uh, that, that really help, can help with your continuous um, distribution more is uh, uh, running hooks, hook scripts in, in, uh, in Git. So um, I don't know how many people use does any, how many people use hook, hook scripts? Git, Git hooks. Okay, okay. that's cool. Uh, well, uh, so basically, it's like. So hook, uh, the Git, you know, Git hook scripts can either sit like on the, yeah, so they can either sit like on the on the serve on the Git repository or on your local, and uh, basically they just uh, you can you know uh, script things on on uh, Git activity basically. So you know, and then there's hooks hooks for uh, a lot of different actions. So it's you know it's you, you can. Uh, yeah, it's quite it's, it's it's quite nice to use. It's a little bit hard to debug uh, sometimes, especially when it's running on the server. But I mean, just little things like having uh, you know, um, you can. I mean, it's easy enough to start out with messages. You can have things like every time there's an update, it emails someone or sort of thing, or just have it uh, set up. Uh, and you sort you can just sort of build build them out really uh, once you got started. So whether it's like a update your live site or you know so on, on commit uh, minifying your uh, minifying your JavaScript or CSS or or uh, yeah uh, uploading uploading uh, uploading files oh, it's, oh, it's really nice there's um yeah so the, there's a few the few actions you can use it's just the, the most useful one probably in practice so so previously um, so that that just if you if you Put your, make your script a GitHub pre uh, a Git hook 
PVC, uh, then it basically it'll it'll run. So you can end up using that for unit testing, or it's, it's really nice. Thing. And the, the nice thing about that is you can set it so it rejects. <laughs> you can you could so you can have it so it runs through the unit test and it rejects the commit if if it fails. You know, which is you know. Or um, yeah, and so some things uh, things like post uh You know, it's really nice for updating uh, updating your your live live site service and stuff. Um, <coughs> So you know it gets a uh, even with uh, you, so you can automate a lot without really like uh, um, investing too much time or, or energy in in uh, setting anything up just just by using uh, Git Git hooks. Um, it's you know it's, it's kind of nice that you, you know you commit your changes and then like two minutes later your website's updated without without you know touching FTP or anything you know it's just like really nice uh, and then yeah yeah it's just uh, it's a nice flow and after a while you're like why did I spend so long FTP in Firefox so, yeah. Uh, yeah so there's a few, uh, like, local ones as well so. uh, I tend to mainly use the ser server uh, repository ones I'm not sure the terminology is written um, Another useful uh, thing, and often you know, you can use in conjunction with uh, with Git hooks is uh, uh, Git FTP. It's really confusing. There's two different Git FTPs. One's a Python script, and the other's a, a Bash script. And I've never used the Python one. It's probably fine, but the Bash one's the one uh, that can be used. Uh, yeah. So you can uh, basically you set config file, and you know it it does the FTP stuff for you. And it's nice in a way because uh, you can use a if you use it with FTP in it, then it just it up, uploads, it FTPs up everything. But if you use um, get FTP catch up, it'll it looks at the file, it only uploads basically only, only uploads the files that change stuff. So that works really well. Um, you know, so you end up with you can, if you have like a, like a, uh, like like a post receipt, for example, you could put you know get. Uh, you put you put you get FTP catch up in your post receive Git hook, and that's basically your automate uh, automated deployment that you just kind of done, you know, in those two steps. Yeah. So it's a command line or something else? Uh, well, it's, it's a bash script, uh, you know, so you just oh. tend to. It's not uh, okay. It's, uh, it's yeah, yeah. It's just, but I think in in some distributions, it's uh, it's you know you can install it with uh, with that. Uh, oh. yeah, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So I just, you know, uh, I tend to put like all the useful scripts in, you know, in one directory, or you know, like, um, you know, put it in the environment variable so it can be just called called anywhere. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Is there any questions about this? Uh, get hooks or get FTP. So. Uh, that's presumably relative to the repository groups. Yeah, yeah, this is a good question actually. So, so what you can, um, so yeah, so there's there's two different ways you can set this up. Um, uh, so that, uh, so if you use, uh, yeah, if you use the commit, uh, get hook, then you can set a different one on each branch, basically, or you. Uh, you know, so it's it different actions per branch. Sort of thing. But if you if you just use the post receive, then that's kind of more like um, uh, you just put it in the truck, you know, in the master or trunk. Yeah. So the deployment will obviously be to be a master release version. Yeah, yeah. But so so for example, if you if you if you could use uh, the uh, commit one, you know, you could have if you had a like like dev stage in prod, you could have a whenever you committed to uh, dev. You know, it ran your automated steps, but whenever you commit it to prod, it would just do the deploy. So that, you know, you can have a nice flow like that. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's really flex flexible um, in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, but it's best to start with start with something simple, and then just and add, add to it. You know, if you, if you sort of try and make a yeah, yeah. to avoid.
you know, just a, a more gentle learning curve with it, sort of thing. Yeah, because it's not always that it's not always that simple to debug, so yeah. <laughs> which is the only downside of it. Um, yeah. So um, I'm gonna quickly quickly look at so that's you know in, in terms of updating things, but yeah, in terms of like deploying uh, whole instances of your uh, uh, Juno, there's a lot of different options really. Um, I, I really like a uh, I'm uh, never sure whether it's Unity or you know it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and uh, Doc is Doc is a good option for development. And so we'll, we'll just we'll just dive into into some of these of these options. Um, so yeah, uh, how many people have used a Kiva Unite Unity? Oh, that's I, I'm always kind of amazed that it's not it's not so widely used because it's, it's really nice. Uh, so. Um, uh, yeah, so basically, it, you know, it automates the extraction of a uh, Kiva backup JPA files um, on the command line. Um, you know, so uh, it's just a PHP script, you know. So, um, and it's, so it has, has an XML-based config, and uh, you know, if say a hypothetical thing, if you add like a hundred sites on a server, you want to move them to another server, you can basically take take the JP, you know, back them all up with Kiva backup, uh, and if you know, moving back up. So you basically have so this uh, concept of an in inbox folder. So for each task you want it to do, you create an XML file which describes the task, and you put that XML file in the inbox. And then when you run a keyboard, uh, you need to, you know, it just basically uh, actions each of those XML files. So you can, you can, you know, you've got you, you, you have you two hundred sites, and you, so you just basically write a quick XML file for each one, and then put the JPA. Uh, in, in the directory do and then just kick it off and it will work through extracting each one. Is it like a, a mass Kickstarter? Yeah, exactly. It's like, like a Kickstarter across all of them. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's like, it's, so yeah, it's basically like Kickstarter except um, with a command line sort of thing mm -hmm. and uh, configuration without without the user interface. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's really nice. Um, you could probably do the same thing using Kickstarter in a headless browser or something like that. Would work. You can join the JPA part of your Kickstarter, that's what you just want to make. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, it's really nice. Um, yeah, so you can yeah, download it from the uh, user place. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you just set a few, a few conf there's a few parts in the config, you know, which is just basically the directories of your server you'd set up. And, uh, and um, yeah, it's, it works really well. It's, it's quick as well, you know. Um, so yeah, you, you know, you end up with like, uh, this is a config file, something like this. You can see, you know, you tell it what the JPA file is called, you tell it what your, uh, your database information, and, uh, you know, uh, like all the questions that Kickstarter uh, asks you basically, so, uh, you know, like uh, database username, password, prefix. Yeah. Yeah, so when it runs, it basically parses all these XML files and then actions them one at a time. Um, yeah, so we we use it quite we use it a lot for yeah. So so basically, how much of time? Um, yeah, we use it a lot for creating new sites. So basically, all so the way the, the apps work, they, they use Joomla as a management system for managing the content on the apps, basically. So, and it's a bunch of custom components. And, uh, but yeah, so when they they build a new app, and, you know everything gets kicked off and gets built. For iTunes and Google Play, and and and, the, and we automatically build a back end for, for that based on a set of seeds, it's different seed templates, different JPA files, and stuff. So yeah, so uh, so yeah, and so we provision a couple of dozen a week get created using uh, yeah using the automated scripting. So basically, we end up in, in uh, uh, calling a a keyboard. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so it's hard to explain, hard to show you like code on in talks, but um, yeah. So we, you know, yeah. So we wrote a script and basically you pass in like three parameters and it goes and it writes your XML file for you and uh, and then kicks off a Kiva uh, Unity to you know. So this is what we use for provision. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's. Um, 
you know, so it's quite easy. And you know, all this stuff is like normal. You've never read this one, you've never read this one. So yeah, basically, you have a, a, a base XML file, and then, um, you know, you, <laughs> you replace a bunch of face over stuff in it, and, um, and then write it out again to a new XML file, and then, uh, you know, this is, this is, uh, this, yeah, so this is, this is sort of running uh, the, the EV, you know, only with my language. It's, I know it's kind of hard running exec PHP from a PHP console. But, um, yeah, so that works really nicely. Um, yeah. So, um, well, some of these are, are big topics in their self, in, the, in their in their, in themselves as well. So, uh, it's, it's good. It's worthwhile touching on Jenkins and Travis because, uh, uh, particularly, Jenkins has really uh, um, revolutionised over like, over you know since its inception. Um, uh, DevOps and continuous integration and deployment. So, yeah. So, um, how many people use Jenkins or Travis? Um, yeah, so uh, Jenkins is, is kind of the original, uh, and then uh, Travis uh, uh, sort of in a sense overtook Jenkins because it's more a config, config file based, but the little, more recent versions of the Jenkins is Jenkins file. Uh, um, yeah. So uh, yeah, typically you use one of the uh, Jenkins or Travis, uh, you know, to um, run tasks within your continuous integration workflow. I guess not the best description. And uh, and more recently, you know, we uh, uh, have Docker as well, which is uh, probably enough for a whole other talk to you. But um, I don't know. But, Docker is great for development, and and some things are really nice. You know, like if you want to test your extension in like five different versions of PHP, you can just spin up a um, you can just like, uh, spin up a Joomla Docker instance with that version of PHP. Or you know, I, I'm not quite sure about the whole like the idea of using Docker for production. Um, I don't know. It's fine. You know, it just doesn't make sense to me. But but some people. Um, you know. Why don't you like Yeah, I don't know. It's, I think maybe. I'm not quite. A friend of mine uh, in, in Glasgow, Dave, he's a, a Docker evangelist. Uh, and uh, we have the same conversation in the pub all the time. But it's just, it's a willy thing. I think it's because it's like transitory, you know, in sort of, it sort of feels. I guess, you know, the, the ability to spin them up and down instances quickly is, you know, it's, it's great for development. but. Yeah, I think if some of them more like, but I, probably like just like a bit degree of permanence with 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 life. So, but you know, but in some instances, if you're like spinning up Docker instances on AWS or you know using one of the cloud hosting platforms, it works really well for that, I guess. You know, because uh, and you know and managing multiple instances of the same thing, you know, with a load balancer, uh, that's sort of thing. That's, you know, it's nice for that, but. Yeah. Yeah, and I suppose I suppose it's kind of like having spent a lot of time, you know, a lot, you know, a lot of time being in, you know, that whole like it doesn't feel being in a kind of like Linux, like like proper lamp environment is like Docker. Yeah, I guess it just feels less familiar. Yeah, and you end up having to jump through hoops that you don't necessarily they wouldn't be there if you were using. A more traditional VM set up for it. Yeah, anyway, so it's easy to. So you can download the community edition. There's a paper one, but. Uh, oh, yeah, and it's not really properly open source either, I guess. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, so you just uh, you just uh, spin up a. You adopt a container like this. Um, there's lots more information on uh, Docker, Docker Hub. And, um, yeah, so. Um, um, yeah, so we can. But yeah, so some things like sort of coming back to the Git hooks, you can have a Git hook that kicked off a Docker container to run your uh, your unit tests, and then you know, and then I just trash it. Um, yeah, there's some 
although there's a, a Docker image in in, um, in in the Docker Docker hubs, like where people, you know, where, where all Docker images are kept in. So there's loads to choose from. It's a Joomla one, but there's also a, a Joomla ones in uh, the Joomla project repository on GitHub, including Docker containers for each PHP version, which is really nice. And it's just a, it just uses a config file, it's just a, a YAML file, and then you, you can use a Docker compose to um, to uh, create containers from your uh, uh, YAML file. And the nice thing is you can you can look at like containers that are already out there, and you can read the the uh, YAML file and see you know what they do, and you can mash mash bits together, and you know it's, it's easy to create new ones really. For, you know, versions, that sort of thing. I'm conscious of time, so. Uh, yeah, just a, and, uh, so, yeah, quickly touch on Vagrant. Um, Vagrant is kind of like a precursor to Docker. Um, it, it's, you know, it's, you know, I don't know, yeah, it's, it's fine too. <laughs> um, yeah, it's the same in the sense of, uh, it's also like really good. Um, Container images uh, for Joomla, and uh, yeah, um, a lot of the a lot of containers. Uh, maybe it's maybe more uh, more geared up for development and, de uh, and testing sort of things. So you can get like there's lots of good vagrant containers, uh, you know, with a, a good array of development tools. So. <coughs> and uh, the Joomla tools, uh, um, the Joomla tools, vagrant uh, base. Uh, it's, it's really nice too. Yeah, so uh, so yeah, it, it's pretty much pretty similar in a way to um, the Docker. You just uh, you initialize it uh, with one command and then uh, kind of spin it up, uh, start it, boot it up, and then you can just SSH onto it. And um, yeah, and then uh, you can just create a site on the Vagrant. Container or instance. Um, yeah. So um, the, the the last option is start deployment. Uh, you know, touch on is uh, is a little bit different in a way. So we uh, I um, something we have been using for a while too um, as an alternative to using the community. So basically, um, I don't know. Uh, odd, uh, so yeah, the idea that you can have one one file system and you can uh, create Joomla instances using symbolic links in uh, in, in Linux uh, is kind of like it's like really simple but possibly really a bit complicated. Um, yeah, so so the idea is uh, um, you can have many Joomla instances and. Uh, but each Joomla instance would only contain uh, basically an uh, index file and a config file, and everything else is just symbolically linked to uh, a, a separate file set. So, you know, so you can have this sort of setup here. So you can have like a, a directory called uh, parents, you might have, and you know, there's different versions in your, your system, uh, uh, so I, uh, you know, they have alpha, beta, and pro, and then you end up with like a children, and each of these children is, would be pointing to one of these parents in a sense so, um, and you can just create as many children as you like. It's like kind of, kind of, it's kind of like a disk, you know, so if you had a hundred Joomla sites on a server, you'd only need one set of Joomla files, which is kind of nice in a way, uh, the whole deduplication thing, but um, yeah. So it's a bit more of a homebrew, home-cooked home uh, option, I guess. Yeah, so, so, so we, we use a uh, script. All these are in the GitHub repository. You know, it's much easier to read there. But uh, yeah, so it's basically you call um, this is a script to uh, create a new child, symlink child. Um, so yeah, so uh, you call a script uh, with a site name and a system name and a source. The source would be like what the parent, the, the name of the parent, so, um, and. Uh, you know, so you know, it goes away. Creates a database, creates a user, creates a creates a, user, creates a database, and uh, gives you user privileges. And then you know, 
they're basically going to dump the database from uh, a source, which is a parent in a sense, and, uh, and then uh, loads the, the database from the parent into uh, the new child. Um, and it goes and makes a bunch of the, you can see, uh, makes, makes a bunch of directories. <laughs> Some of these directories, obviously, you need like the images directory. So each each child would have its own images directory, but uh, and cache and temp and logs. So these are, like, in a sense, the real directories, and everything else ends up being, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, and then you take the configuration. Uh, file from your parent, uh, and you uh, replace a bunch of stuff. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. uh, so you replace uh, replace them with a new system name, database name, and something. And then you you uh, you write out the configuration file back to the child, the new child that you just created. Um, and you do need some physical files, but the only ones you need is uh, HD access. Uh, Roblox uh, index, uh, the front end index and the back end index. Uh, so that's physically copying the files. And then, uh, and, and this is, here you can see what appear in uh, symbolic links. Uh, it's just a shortcut, I'm not used to symbolic links. Uh, yeah, so you've written symbolic links from uh, the parent to the child. So these are these are all uh, links for what exactly. And then, you know, I need them in the script folder as well. Um, yeah, so the advantage is, apart from having only, you know, kind of one set of files from all the sites, you know, you can update things from one place and it's updated everywhere. Um, yeah, so that's. If you wanted to put on a, if you wanted to put an extension, Mm -hmm. Would you put it into the parents and it would be replicated across all the children? Yeah. Or would yeah. you put it just into a child and it would be in that one child? Uh, you, see, you, you couldn't, you couldn't, um, you put it in the parent. Because in, in practice, the uh, the child doesn't, doesn't, doesn't have anything. It only knows what the parent's got. So, so they always have to be in sync as it were for all extensions. Yeah, yeah. So that's, in a sense, that's, that's where it gets more complicated. So for example, uh, if you want to do uh, update Joomla, you you'd up, you can update in the parent, you know, because yes. you can run the parent as a live site as well, sort of thing. Um, but then, you know, well, that's great because uh, you, you, all, all the files are now updated in all the children because the parents updated. But you still got to update the database in all the children, so you yeah. you you probably end up having to run like I don't know, like run like an or, or you could use the Joomla command line interface to update. You probably can't use that actually. Like, yeah, well, the way we tend to do is with like a headless browser it basically logs into administrator, goes into extensions database and clicks the fix button, and then it goes and fixes it. You know, which is, yeah. So that, it, that that's kind of the, it, there's added complexity in that sense, and that's, that's the downside. Mm. So it's, it's only really useful if you've got like, like hundreds, you know, of sites that are all kind of the same, I suppose, you know. Uh, so yeah, and equally so, we had the first script that's for deploying a symlink child, and uh, there's a, another script for, for repointing a symlink child. So so it's, it's kind of, you know kind of not works nicely. So you end up with like two parents, one's like live and the other is like dev, um, or you know one's like v1, v2. You can uh, you can basically update the child to be pointing to a different parent. You know. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so basically you'd, you'd run the script and you'd pass in the source and you'd pass in the target and it would go and uh, change uh, change the child to point to. So, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of nice. You can update all the updates will be uh, instantaneous. There's no, if you wanted to switch from version 1 to version 2, it's just switch the sim loops. And, so you can see basically it's just uh, so that's yeah, just like forced to overwrite the existing symbling. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you can see. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, as a use case, having hundreds of sites which are almost exactly the same is not really that common a thing, I guess. 
<laughs> but, um, but you know, there's some things like Joomla.com, uh, uh, like SiteGround. Is that SiteGround they do Joomla.com? Uh, where they basically have like thousands of Joomla sites and they've all only got like a fixed number of templates and a fixed number or and you can't have you can't add extensions. Oh, it would probably work really well for them, you know, because they could have their thousands of Joomla websites with like one bunch of files, you know, one Joomla file set. So. But not too many people do that. Um, is there any questions on that before? I know that's quite complicated. But no. Just, uh, so next we're going to touch on uh, headless automation via headless browsing. Um, how many people use head headless browsers? Not thinking. So, so uh, headless browsers have been around quite a long time. Uh, a bit back in the um, So, um, and basically, it's a way to script. Uh, the physical inter interaction that a user would have with a uh, website, you know. Uh, so yeah, historically, it's usually done with Selenium, and you'd write your script, and then Selenium would go and execute your, you know, your actions. Click, you know, click this button, click that button, that sort of thing. Um, Selenium is nice. It's a bit Java. -y. It's kind of a heavy Java, Java thing. Um, but uh, you know, it's quite a lot. And there's uh, other ones more recently. It's quite complicated because it's like. Um, there's both dr drivers and kind of libraries in a way. So, so uh, Phantom.js is another headless browser that's a bit newer, and Nightmare is like an optimization of Phantom.js. And, uh, and you know, there's different uh, drivers for these headless browsers. So, uh, so uh, Casper.js is like an easy, is kind of like just a wrapper layer of, of Phantom. It's a lot easier to use the script. You still got to write JavaScript, but apart from that. And, uh, uh, code set is a code set is a like a JavaScript version of code codeception in a sense, which is it, really nice. Um, code set is my favourite at the moment. <laughs> Zombie JS is another new one too. Um, so yeah, you just automate tasks, uh, you know, and find objects to click and interact with through the document object model. Um, yeah, it's nice. And um, usually, it tends to be used more, more for testing, like system testing. Acceptance testing rather than automation itself, but but it, it works well for automation too. Uh, yeah, automating automating tests and automating tasks like you, can, you know basically nearly anything that you can do physically you could automate with a headless browser. Uh, there's all, occasionally a few gotchas. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, when dive into Casper JS, I've been using Casper JS for about three years, I guess. Uh, it's you can see the code is a uh, Casper script. I think this one. Oh yeah. So this object, this just this Casper script, uh, script just updates Joomla basically. Uh, so you you know you start Casper. Uh, I JavaScript here, so it's quite, You set set your your screen size. Um, uh, it's you know, and there's some date stamps and stuff. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. You, you pass in three parameters: domain name, username, and password. It's fine, normal. Yeah, so you can see it's like Casper start goes to the administrator folder, and you know it uh, fills in the form, which is the login form, username, and password, with the ones you set. And then, but you, because it's JavaScript, and JavaScript, it's kind of like forced to be sequential, even though it's kind of you know. It's like, I just one node, I guess. Is, uh, yeah, so you can. So this sort of tells you that's for then. I think it's, it's kind of to, to to make it execute concurrently one thing at a time, unlike node you would usually do. Um, yeah, yeah. So you know, you can see all these things. Oh, yeah. So some of these things, like the screen capture things, is quite nice. I don't know. You know, you can just set a Casper script, right? A quick Casper script. That goes to like nearly every page of your website and takes a screen grab, and then just you can like visually skim over the images and say, oh, yeah, yeah, they look fine. You know, if you do that, or, or um, if you wanted, you know, some really quick mobile testing, you can you can change change this down to be like more like a phone size, and and then screen grab uh, your responsive uh, views as well. So, so. 
Yeah, so you can see sort of log in, you know, this just you know, this sort of thing is just you know, the screen screen grab by the you know, you know stuff, it's just got a date stamp in it anyway, so and uh, yeah, it's, it's JavaScript, it's ugly. So yeah, we can see uh, we're checking in this fetch text status. So basically you're looking for a button and uh, then you're looking Yeah, so this uh, it just like reads the Joomla version from the footer of the administrator's template and compares that with uh, the version that you set. Yeah, this sort of thing. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Click on the purge button in the admin bit. Take another screen grab. <laughs> End up with a lot of screen grabs. We run an automated testing across our suite, suite uh, across our platform. So it basically logs into every uh, Jupyter instance and it takes maybe a couple of hours to run and you end up with like a gigabyte of, of PNG files that you can skim over to check. check.